I felt before I heard the bullets. It was already hot because it's summertime in Helmand province, but I could feel streaks of heat zip across my head and in front of me. And, you know, it sounds like, and then you know, immediately after that zipping sound, it's like, crack, crack, crack. And just then I was like, okay, well, I've got to start running. And I, I saw a little spot that it would have given me some cover and concealment. So I started running to that. Just as I looked towards this compound wall where that was coming from, and a dude popped over there, but shot an RPG at me. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear our first combat story from a Marine Corps infantry officer turned civil affairs officer, Frank Gus Biggio. Gus has a very unusual history in that he served his initial five years in the Marine Corps pre-9-11 and then got out to begin a very promising and successful career as an attorney. In the years following 9-11, however, Gus felt the need to return to service and support the war effort. So rather than hold on to a profitable and cushy corporate career, Gus did what many of us dream of doing, and he went back in. He deployed in 2009 as a civil affairs officer, which you could think of as a local mayor or governor of a particular area, in this case, Nawa, where he settled local disputes, funded development efforts, compensated families for losses as a result of the war, and far more. This required significant time outside the wire and in harm's way. Do not be fooled into thinking that this is an administrative role. I spoke to now Sergeant Major David Wilson, who led the patrols that protected Gus as he moved around the battle space, and he confirmed that it was anything but quiet, and that Gus shifted the balance of power locally, driving significant counterinsurgency wins for his battalion. Gus chronicled his experience and the service of his fellow Marines in the book, The Wolves of Hellman, subtitle, A View from Inside the Den of Modern War. It's a great read, and is now directing the proceeds of this book to a charitable cause supporting efforts in Ukraine, which we touch on. This is a wide ranging discussion with the laughs, heartache and nostalgia of someone who gave up everything, including missing the birth of his second child to be downrange with his fellow Marines. And I hope you enjoy his combat story as much as I did. Gus, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us. Thanks Ryan, It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I try to always start out these interviews when people have what looks like an interesting nickname with that kicking off. So I know your name is Frank, but everybody calls you Gus. Where does that come from? So I blame my parents for the confusion. Um, My, my middle name is Augustus and I'm, I, the Frank A. Biggio is named after my grandfather who was Frank Aloysius Biggio. Uh, And my parents wanted to name me after my grandfather, but they wanted a kid named Gus too. So we, they took the Frank and the A, uh, but, but went with Gus. And I know that you're going to ask questions about family military history. And so I'm going to give a plug for Frank Aloysius Biggio. He is a World War I veteran. He died before I was born. Wow. Uh, and he was a little bit older when when uh, my dad was born, but he's a World War I veteran, um, served with the Big Red One. Uh, and he was, he was in the shit. Uh, he was in the Meuse and the Argonne Forest. Um, at the, the height of U.S. involvement in the war. So uh, I'm glad he wow. made it and uh, produced a couple of videos that led to me talking to you. Did uh, did any w- were there any written accounts from him that your family still has or any anything that he had left behind? We have some pictures and we have a couple little journals and, and, and bits of journals and some notes that, that he took from there and a few trinkets and artifacts that that he was presented with is a service there and some things that he, that he picked up. Um, and fortunately my, my dad has had a little bit of a writing bug too. And so he wrote a great book self published called you told me that before dad, which is, is a lot uh, of his, his family history, but particularly focusing on his dad. And it's not just about world war one, but it's about growing up in Steubenville, Ohio and, and uh, getting the benefit of his dad's wisdom as, as a young man. That's interesting. Okay. So, and, and now we know kind of uh, where the writing bug comes from, maybe with the the Wolves of Hellman. So yes, yeah. f- for you, Gus, as you mentioned, like you blame that, that nickname on your parents, 
when you were growing up, were people calling you Frank or Gus or where, what did you use? Always went by Gus. Uh, and I knew I was in trouble when somebody uh, addressed me as Frank Augustus. So whether that was my parents or teachers or uh, anybody else. So uh, I answer to both, uh, but Gus is what would most people call me. Okay. And now you're, you're in a very prestigious company. You've got a great career. We're going to talk about some of the craziness that goes on um, with your time in uniform. But I was really surprised when I was preparing for this to hear you describe yourself as a bit of a hellraiser as a kid. So I'm curious, for some reason that takes me by surprise. Can you give us an idea of what you were like as a kid and what some of those hell raising moments might have looked like? So when I was in preschool, uh, my mom got called in to talk to the teachers about Gus. And one of the teachers paused for a long moment and said, Gus is an enigma. And so I've always taken that as, as a source of pride, but I like to be in a little bit of a class clown. I like to be in the center of some of the antics and some of the, the shenanigans that were going on, whether that was in preschool or even through college. Um, and I always stayed on probably the right side of le legality, or if we were doing something that was a little bit too out of control, I stayed on the right side of plausible deniability. Um, but, you know, at, at a certain point, we've got to grow up. And so when I did end up joining the Marine Corps, that came to a lot of my friends that came as a bit of surprise. And one of my close friends told me, he said, you know, you didn't seem like the type of person who would join the Marine Corps, particularly a branch or, or join the military, but particularly a branch like the Marine Corps. But at the same time, I can totally see it. So <laughs> it's, it's great because. I think we're going to pull through some of these threads to your time when you're in Afghanistan. So this is really interesting. Um, there are two names that I wanted to make sure we talk about, Walt Williams and Dave Briggs, who had an influence on you growing up. And I'm, I want to possibly tie this together with where we went wrong for your uh, your great grand or your grandfather, as you mentioned, being in the Big Red One, a great army unit. And then you finding your way to the Marine Corps. Where, where did the Army go wrong to lose track of you? And maybe it was was Walt or Dave. So um, there were a lot of people who played, had, had some influence in me choosing to join the Marine Corps. Uh, my parents in particular. And it wasn't because I come from a long line of people who did careers in the military. Uh, my, my dad was in the Navy. And by his own account, he had a relatively peaceful tour in the Navy, uh, but, but he was always very proud of that. My my dad's brother was in the Army. Uh, my uncle on my mom's side was in the Army in, in Vietnam, and he was in some pretty intense action. He's a multiple Purple Heart winner and Bronze Star winner. Uh, and as I mentioned before, my grandfather was in the Big Red One. But where I grew up in Ohio, relatively small, close-knit community. Um, there's a college town here. There was some vibrant industry. And I was always a guest at my dad's Rotary Club, and we knew all these people in town. And whenever I would go to Rotary Club or these other events, and I would see people who were his age or older, a lot of World War II vets in the club, there was a large veteran cadre there. And some of them would wear maybe a little lapel pin of a personal ward or their, their service branch. But it seemed to me that all of the leaders in the community, everybody who played a significant role in business or the community leadership, had served in the military at one point in their lives. And so to me, it seemed like a commonsensical part of growing up. Again, we talked about me being a hellraiser, and we knew that at a certain point I'm going to have to grow up. Uh, so there's a lot of folks that I can point to. Harold Friedlander, who was a World War II veteran, liberated a couple of the death camps. Uh, very, very well-known person in the community. Walt Williams, his former Marine, he was the uh, CEO of Rubbermaid, big global in international corporation. And there was something about the demeanor uh, that, that Walt Williams carried himself that had to have stemmed from when he was a Marine Corps. Uh, one of our close friends, Ron Holtman, was was an Air Force Jag. He, he too had that same demeanor about him. But I want to talk specifically about Dave Briggs. Dave Briggs is a guy that I can remember for as, as when I was four years old. It's like I want to be like him when I grow up, and I still say that. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but he was one of the adults who always came on our Boy Scout trips. And every time we would go on one of these trips, he had this huge van, and everyone wanted to ride in the van with Mr. Briggs because he would tell stories 
about serving in the military. And they weren't combat, blow them up, shoot them up type of things, but he had his share of that. But he talked about the camaraderie and the leadership opportunities and, and the brotherhood that he felt there. And um, there was a couple of times where he, some of the stories that he told really made sense to us. And one of them was we were out camping and there was some boulders and there was a big rock face. And we said, okay, well, we're, we're Boy Scouts. We're, we're going to rappel down there. And we had this really shitty rope and we had a horrible plan. In fact, we didn't have a plan. We tied a slip knot around the rope and tied it around a rock. And we said, this is good enough. And I was at the top of this hill and I was sort of leading the charge, but I was not a leader. And thank goodness Mr. Briggs came along at the right moment. He said, what are you guys doing? And we explained to him and he said, okay, who's going to go first? And even though I was the leader of this group, I was like, you know, hell no, I'm not going to do that. And he was like, you're the guy who's in charge. If you tie the knot, you've got to test your knot and you've got to be the guy who goes first. And he's like, but before you do something stupid, let me point out a couple of things. He showed us something with the knot. We were completely screwed up. Um, this was like a farm rope, you know, thick and, and abrasive. And we didn't have, you know, the concept of gloves or the concept of using your legs to help you get down. None of this uh, made any sense to us. And he showed us all these little things that we were doing wrong. And then he went into his experience in Vietnam. He's like, when, when we were in Vietnam, this is what we did. This is how we did it. And this is why we did it. We had a plan. We had a process. Uh, and the leader always went first. And that made a, a big impression on me. And fast forward, um, you know, maybe about, um, you know, six or eight years after that, when I was a senior in high school, one of the teachers who I was extremely fond of his name, Garth Fowler. He was in the army as a West Point grad. He had served in Vietnam too. And like these other folks I talked about, just the way he carried himself, you always knew that he had been in the military. And of course, if you didn't know, he would remind you that he was, but he was never a rub it in your face kind of guy. But I distinctly remember my senior year in physics class, one of my classmates named Mark Dreyfus was graduating early because he had enlisted in the Marine Corps and his report date was a little bit before the, the end of school. And Mr. Fowler gave a speech uh, to our class explaining that this was going to be Mark's last day in, in class. And there was something about the way he described that and he described the sense of service on and how proud he was of, of Mark and what Mark was about ready to embark on. And I thought, my goodness, you know, for, for Garth Fowler, somebody who has done what he's done when he was in the military and done what he's done as a teacher um, and, and then been a part of our community to almost be tearful with, with joy about what this, this young man from our community was going to do. It's like, you know, I hope that someday I can do something to earn the respect of people like Garth Fowler. Uh, and, and that sort of solidified in my mind. It's like, you know, I will join the Marine Corps. I'm going to go to college, but uh, I'm, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. And the, that, that, that was it for me. That, that's really interesting because this is a different time. And for people who, who may not have heard the intro, we're going to jump from two very different eras it, from a military standpoint, the, kind of the pre to post 9-11 era. And what you're talking about is joining in the pre 9-11 era and then rejoining later, which we'll get to, right? So you have that moment, you kind of make your mind up, you're going to go to college. Who do you consult for that? Is it a difficult decision um, for going into the Marine Corps after college? So it, it wasn't a, a big decision. It was always something I, I was never too vocal about what my plans were, but in the back of my mind, I, I knew I was going to do it. Around my sophomore year in college, I figured, geez, you know, now I've got to actually make some concrete plans. So I talked to my parents about it, and that was an easy conversation. Uh, they were supportive of it. As, as I said, you know, there was a sense of patriotism in our home and in our community. Um, and I think that my parents sort of expected this all along. When I said Marine Corps, I remember my dad kind of raising an eyebrows, and he's like, that's, that's a different class of people. And I said, yeah, I'm going to give it a try. Uh, but I did that and uh, ended up talking with uh, – uh, officer selection officer named Mike Starich, who I'm fortunate to still keep in touch with today. And he was fantastic. He got me through uh, the, the process. And between my junior and senior year of college, uh, I, I did my officer candidate school 12 weeks in Quantico, which is, uh, as you know, from your own experience and from talking to some of your other guests, you know, that's a weeding out process. 
And there were times where I kind of felt like some of the instructors had their eye on me to weed me out, but uh, I was able to, to get through. Uh, came back and finished my senior year of college, and then I was uh, commissioned then. And keep in mind, this is uh, when I got commissioned, it was 1993. So this was just after the big war of my time. I was in college watching Desert Storm and almost kind of thinking like, shit, you know, I, I, I missed my big war. But other things happened. Uh, Somalia was was front page news. Uh, Panama had happened a few years earlier. Uh, but but there were small scale things going on. And by the end of the Cold War, I was thinking, well, I think I made the right choice with the Marine Corps because it's expeditionary, it's explosive, it's lethal, it's tip of the spear. And I might not go to a big war like Desert Storm, uh, but I'm going to have my small scale engagement. So got commission after uh, graduation, was uh, able to get selected for infantry, did some more training in Quantico with IOC, then was stationed uh, out at Camp Pendleton with the 1st Marines, did two deployments, uh, pretty much hit every billet in a rifle company. I was a rifle platoon commander, moved over a weapons company with heavy guns, had a uh, couple of pucker factor moments on, on two deployments to the Westpac, uh, finished up as a rifle company XO. In the last few months, I had picked up captain. And in that post-deployment return period, I, I, I was a, a company commander, but did my time a little over four and a half years, close to five years. Um, and, and I felt was like this is exactly why I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, I wanted to be a grunt, wanted to lead people, uh, got out as a junior captain and I said, now I'm going to go into the first civilian division, but I'm always going to be an advocate and a cheerleader and ambassador for the Marine Corps. And that's what I did for a couple of years. Uh, was it hard to walk away from? Because we're going to get to a point where you decide to go back. Um, how hard was it to break contact at that time? So for me, it was it was not hard. Uh, you You know, from your experience, that there is a camaraderie and a sense of brotherhood and belonging and purpose that comes with military service, whether you've done four or 40 years or in between. Yeah. So I was uh, sad to see, to, to leave some of my friends, uh, but I was proud of a lot of them who decided that they wanted to stick it in for, for a little bit longer and, and do another tour. And obviously uh, we, we stayed in close touch and as they did their third and their fourth deployments, uh, we always stayed in touch and I made sure that I would support them with with care packages and everything. And even though I was, you know, had left the Marine Corps at that time, pretty much everybody who knew me figured out pretty quickly that that I had been in the Marines because most of my stories started with, oh, that reminds me of this one guy I knew in the Marine Corps. Oh, that reminds me of this one time that I was in the Marine Corps. So um, that that was that was a pretty common part of my vernacular. Got it. And you don't go on to do just anything. I mean, you have a very successful career um, following that first time in the Marine Corps. So I, I just want to set the ground groundwork for people as we as we inch towards 9-11 and then into the post 9-11 era. You've got a very good thing going as a civilian in the first civilian corps, I think is what you called it. Um, where were you at on 9-11 and what what impact did it have on you? So uh, 9 11, I, I, I went to graduate school after the Marine Corps and I, and I returned to Ohio. I went to Case Western Reserve and I ended up doing a joint business law program. It's a four year program, but I took some extra course loads and took some summer school. So I was able to finish it in three and a half years. My final semester started in the fall of 2001. The previous year, as part of the law journal that I was on, we had to write a, a law school thesis. So I wrote a thesis that had a really bizarre concept. I talked about the emerging asymmetric warfare threat and that the enemies that the United States was going to face weren't going to be nation states like China and Russia, although we shouldn't dis disregard those potential threats, but it's going to be terrorists. It's going to be small groups of state-sponsored organizations that are, that are disruptive to, to larger scale operations. And so I talked about the threat of terrorism. In this article, I had to spend a couple pages explaining who this guy named Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was also. But I proposed a couple innovative ideas at the time. One was that we need to be able to take preemptive action against potential terrorist threats. And if we need to go into the sovereign territory of another country against their will or against their knowledge to take this preemptive action, that we should be able to do it. And I laid out the legal framework for that. Um, it ruffled a couple of feathers and, and 
upset some of the professors who were reading and analyzing this, but ended up getting a writing award for it. And I had hoped that it would just be a theoretical topic. 9-11 happened. I distinctly remember that it was a Tuesday and I was in my law journal office and some one of my friends came in and said, hey, man, a plane just hit one of the World Trade Tower buildings. And I thought, OK, well, some idiot in a Cessna, you know, lost control and hit it. And, you know, so a couple of people probably died. Um, and, you know, that that's too bad. Um, certainly within minutes, we realized that something else was 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 going on. So I, I was glued to the TV just like everybody else that day. And as I can imagine you and probably everybody who's been on your show, everybody who's listened to your show, there is a deep, visceral burning of anger and, and, and sadness in me. Uh, but I also knew that in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, my friends, you know, Pete, Matt, Ben, Tom, you can go down the list. It's like, they're going to go get some. And they're going to show people that um, that you shouldn't have, have done this. And, and that we're going to respond pretty viciously. And they did. Interesting enough, the first U.S. Marines on the ground in Afghanistan uh, were led, the, the task force was led by a one-star general named Jim Mattis. Uh, and they embarked off the, the USS Boxer, which is uh, the ship that I deployed on, on on my second deployment when I was on active duty. Uh, a member of that unit was also named Tom Sowers, who I didn't know him at the time, but I ended up meeting him uh, when he was the battalion sergeant major of the unit that I supported in Afghanistan a couple of years later. That's so cool. Wow. So unlike many of the guests that I've had on the show, not many of them had been out of service already, and then we're going to go back in. So how did the fact that you had been in before, and you're probably looking at, as you said, some of the people you had served with going into this next fight, how did that land with you? So when 9-11 happened, part of me thought, man, I want to get back into the action. But I've made my decision. I've made my career decision, my professional choices. And I'm finishing up school. I need to take the bar exam and, and pursue the professional career. I'll continue to be an advocate for uh, the Marine Corps and the military, but I've got to do it out of uniform. A couple of years went by. And as, as you know, thing, things kept moving in Afghanistan. And then we directed our attention to Iraq. Um, and again, my friends were going on their third and their fourth and their fifth appointments there. And I was watching what was happening. And I ended up in as, as a corporate lawyer where my uniform was a pinstripe suit and wingtip shoes and a Windsor knot in, in my, my tie. And my value to the organization was being determined uh, by billable hours. Uh, and I'll be quite frank that I was envious and I was a little bit jealous of what my friends were doing. And I wanted to get in on the action. By this time, I thought, well, you know, it's a little bit too late. But uh, one of the events I would go to in Washington, D.C., I ran into a Marine general named Mike Ennis. And we were talking about things that, that Marines have in common. And I said, gosh, you know, sometimes I wish I could get back into it. But, you know, I've been out too long, so I won't be able to. And he said, well, hold on a second. If you're serious about that, let me tell you who you can get in touch with. And he did some little, he looked something up and he gave me the number for um, a Marine major who was in charge of the Civil Affairs Group, which is a reserve unit based out in Washington, D.C. And it seemed interesting. I liked their mission. Um, I liked the fact that they were a reserve unit nearby. And I thought, OK, this is, might be something I want to do. So I called the major the next day and we chatted informally about this. And I said, you know, I might want to come back in. He said, we can make that happen. But are you married? And I said, yes, I am. He's like, have you spoken to your wife? And I said, not yet. He goes, talk to your wife and then call me. So unlike the first time where I was nearing the end of college and it's like, okay, this is a logical progression of what someone does as they're growing up. I have to talk to someone else now. And it was my wife. So in the lottery of life, there are a few jackpots that we can hit. I hit that with my parents and where I grew up and how I was raised, but I hit it big time with who um, was kind enough to marry me, who was my wife. She did not know me when I was in the Marine Corps, but she knew that the Marine Corps was part of our DNA. I explained this crazy concept to her. It's like, hey, I'm at a law firm. We can pay the bills. It's a great place. Um, but sometimes I hate it. And 
what would you think about if I went into the Marine Corps one more time to do one more tour? And so she paused for a second. She's like, I get it. I know this is part of who you are. And so I support it, but this counts as your midlife crisis. So don't go out and buy a fancy sports car or, uh, you know, get an earring or anything like that. So this, this counts and you can do it and you can do one tour and then that's got to, you know, satisfy that itch and you can do it. So, um, you know, I am forever grateful, but also forever indebted to my wife for her support for that. And particularly when I deployed to Afghanistan, by that time, uh, we had one kid and we had another one on the way. And so, you know, she was holding down the home fort, uh, working full time while I was in a, in a pretty hot spot. Wow. All right. A couple things. Um, First, if that general hadn't had that encounter with you, if you guys hadn't done that and he went and was proactive and got you in touch with the civil affairs group, do you think you would have found your way there anyway or to the back into combat? I, very likely not. Very likely not. Um, <clears throat> he told me about a unit that I was not aware of, and he told me about a specific person that, that I wasn't aware of. Uh, and he also open the doors of possibility about essentially being a prior service recruit, particularly with, with as much time out of service as, as I had. So, um, yeah, if, if, if I hadn't gone to that event and spoken to that general, uh, I would probably be one of these guys saying, you know, I was in, but, um, I was in, in between the wars. So, yeah. Oh, wow. What, what a serendipity of that. And then, it, we got to talk just for a minute about this discussion with your wife. I mean, not every spouse would be that, <laughs> that accommodating. And I do, the more that I talk to to younger folks now who are getting into the service and they're asking for advice and, and what they can do after hearing people on this show, a big part of that, especially people who want to get into the intel community, but military in general with how often you move and how unpredictable it is a big part of that discussion is who you spend your life with, right? Like you cannot do that unilaterally. It does not work. It's got to be a decision. And that person has to be bought in and understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, you can do it, but it won't, you won't succeed in the long run. You need that support. So it's amazing. You had that. You're absolutely right. And um, as you've seen from, from your experience in, in uh, the army and the agency, uh, you know, people try to make it work, but sometimes if there's not that close alignment, you unfortunately get uh, high rates of dissatisfaction, which either results in attrition within the organization or more importantly, uh, broken marriages. Yeah. So uh, sure. it, it takes it takes a special breed. And particularly when you're talking to folks who are considering the military, um, if, if they're married or if, if they're about to be that, that's something that they need to heavily, heavily consider. And their, their spouse has to be hundred percent on board and be prepared to make tremendous sacrifices. God. And I can't remember if I'd mentioned this on the show, but at one point after I'd gotten out of the army, but before I made it to the agency, I by myself drove without telling my wife to, I think it's 19th group uh, headquarters in North Carolina, right on the border with Virginia. And I was like, Hey, just kicking the tires. Could <laughs> I come in and just go to selection? And they're like, you could do it. They didn't ask me though. Have you talked to your wife? But they could probably read it on me that they knew I had not. Um, so I never even had that discussion. I called my brother and he's like, dude, do not do this. You got to talk to your wife before you do that. So very interesting parallel there. So the next thing is you go to civil affairs. So I have I, I want to talk about what civil affairs is. If we can, we'll kind of jump to that in just a moment. But you went from being a, a Marine infantry officer to civil affairs, which I feel like is a big jump in what you do day to day in those two fields. How did you feel about making that move to civil affairs? And did you ever consider like, hey, maybe I can get back into the infantry? Here? The civil affairs was the exact right unit for someone with my prior Marine experience and also the educational and professional experience that I'd had in between coming back in. Uh, I was quite a bit older. I was quite a bit older than the typical captain when I uh, was recommissioned. I was uh, 37 years old. And I was able to come back in as a captain because that's the, the rank where I left. So my friends who had stayed in were uh, majors, lieutenant colonels, you know, they had gone through the typical career progression. So it just would not have fit for me to jump into a, a 
line uh, line unit. Uh, you know, I probably would have been a company commander in an infantry unit, but I just don't think it would have worked for me or for the Marines or for the Marine Corps. Civil affairs, much smaller unit, a uh, little bit more of a focused, specialized uh, mission. We do all the basic stuff that the Marines do. You know, we shoot, move, and communicate. The, the name tag above our left, left breast says U.S. Marines. It doesn't say U.S. Marines parentheses, reservists, parentheses, civil affairs. It's U.S. Marines. So we do all that stuff, but we do a little bit more. Uh, it was a fantastic unit. We had people in that unit who were, we had a, literally a rocket scientist for NASA. We had folks who worked for the intelligence agencies, the uh, legislative branch. We had people who were firefighters, policemen. We had people who were college professors, journalists, uh, business executives. And, and these were enlisted in officer ranks. So we, it was just a tremendous uh, talent, uh, both from core Marine Corps skills to the intellectual experience that they had. So I was, I was in my element with exactly the type of unit that I anticipated being part of when I came back in. And let's use that as a springboard to share what civil affairs does, because we have not had anybody on the program who's talked about that. Um, I, I am aware, but for, for listeners, could you kind of talk through what the mission set is for a civil affairs unit, what the expectations were? And you, I think you very well described who might make up such a unit. And now, like, why would you need people with those backgrounds, basically? Sure thing. So civil affairs, I think in the army, civil affairs actually falls under special forces. And it's fair to say that they are, in fact, part of the special forces. Now, civil affairs isn't typically the, the type of special forces like the Navy SEALs or Delta Force that go kicking down doors and that are doing DA missions, but they do have a very special mission. And that's essentially to embed and engage with the locals. Sometimes that means doing administrative tasks like making payments for things that that, that kinetic engagements have, have broken, or you know, if we've injured or killed somebody, we have to make condolence payments for that. Uh, but we also do area assessments, both on the infrastructure, but then the atmospherics. We do key leader engagements where we sit down with tribal leaders and find out what's ticking in their minds. Um, we um, you know, work with the the non-military agencies that might be working in an AO, whether it's uh, intel agencies or more likely, you know, State Department, USAID, NGOs. Uh, and sometimes we are involved in in the PR mission of, of, of our unit and also shaping some of the information operations missions to get the, the message out to the locals of, of where we're deploying. Um, and lastly, I, I've already mentioned it, but it's always worth, worth mentioning. We do fundamental combat infantry stuff with the units that we serve with too. So uh, every civil affairs Marine uh, is a rifleman first. Um, and the, the ones I was with in Afghanistan, uh, we were, were part of plenty of kinetic engagements as well as sitting down and drinking tea with, with the locals. Was there any psyops element attached to y'all or was that a separate unit? So civil affairs doesn't do psyops. You could probably argue that part of the information operations falls under that broad umbrella. We did briefly have uh, some army guys with us who were from a specific PSYOPs uh, unit. And and they they were part of our shaping the battlefield yeah. operations in the, the first stages of Operation Kanjar. Uh, but I think about after a month, they had moved on to some other AOs. Got it. All right, perfect. So you mentioned Kanjar. I, I want to set the stage for people about what you're getting into. And this is very well depicted in the Wolves of Hellman, right? So like this, this is what we're we're going to dive into into more detail of your experiences there. And I don't want people to be like, oh, it was civil affairs, so nothing happened. No, no, no. This is very interesting. Um, and I, I had the good fortune of speaking to now Sergeant Major David Wilson, who you had uh, graciously connected me with, who served with you there as, and help me characterize it correctly, but as talking talking to Dave, he was your kind of like on the patrols with y'all moving around the battle space. And he was the, the Marine infantrymen to, with leading these patrols to make sure what was done on the patrol was safe. But he was witnessing all this from an infantryman or a Marine rifleman's perspective where so much of the civil affairs was going on that he hadn't seen before. So he gave us a lot of context and he was like, yeah, we were doing civil affairs, but it felt very much like we were just out on patrol, like another unit. So I don't want people to think, oh, we're talking civil affairs. It's all uh, drinking tea. It's it's very important for the battle space. So you talked about Conjar. 
Can you talk about where we're at from a military standpoint there in terms of coin operations at the time? Because I believe that's what you guys are going in to do. Absolutely. So <clears throat> Operation Kanjar, Kanjar is, is um, Pashto for strike of the sword. Uh, this kicked off in midsummer 2009. So if you recall in 2009, Afghanistan was always already being referred to as the long war. We were eight years into it. The mission, other than that initial six to 12 month period where it was a counterterrorism mission, the mission had always been in flux and oftentimes never clearly defined and success was never clearly defined. By 2009, we had a new president and we had a new commander in Afghanistan. And we realized that what, was, what we were trying to do in Afghanistan wasn't quite working. We had also it, it seen some successes with the counterinsurgency approach in, in uh, Iraq, particularly in Anbar province. Uh, General McChrystal was, was a key driver of that success, and he wanted to try it in Afghanistan. Big country. It's about the size of Texas. So where do you do this? Well, at the time, there was a very limited presence, particularly U.S. forces uh, in Helmand province. But that was the hot spot of insurgency. That's where uh, the opium production was taking place. Uh, and the profits from that were being used to buy bombs and weapons and, and further the, the insurgency. And so they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to send Marines into there. We were part of a brigade of Marines led by General Larry Nicholson. Uh, so we had, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we had uh, uh, three battalions of, of Marines. We had all the aviation support and all the combat logistics support there. And so we, we knew that a successful counterinsurgency mission had to essentially start with flooding the zone. Uh, there were a few pockets of British military forces in Helmand province, but they were undermanned and they, they were outgunned. None of them could travel probably more than 100 meters from their patrol base without being pretty significantly engaged. So we needed to come in and, and turn the tides there. Uh, Operation Kanjar started in two phases, but one of them was sort of a a, a, a a grounding phase where we came in with about 100 Marines and we got the word out that, that the Marines were coming. Uh, we came in and we started pushing that, that safety zone out 500 and 1,000 meters. For the first four or five weeks that we were there, we got an engagement every time we went out on patrol. And my civil affairs Marines were, were part of those and I was, I was part of that. Uh, and then we paused for about a week. And I think the message that the insurgents got was like, okay, they came with a couple more people and they pushed the security zone out that far. So that's where we're going to stay and we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And then on the evening of July 1st, 2001, we came in with three battalions of Marines all over Helmand province. My district was called Nawa. So our reinforced infantry battalion was close to a thousand Marines, uh, three rifle companies, weapons company, uh, you know, dropped in by helicopter, coming in by MRAPs and armored Humvees, we flooded the zone. So the insurgents quickly got the message. Uh, and the ones who wanted to stay and fight, they fought, but not for long. Uh, the ones who wanted to get the heck out of there, they did. They ended up going to Marja and Marines came in a few months later and, and dealt with them. Uh, but then a lot of them who might have been what we would call little T Taliban, who maybe weren't ideologically aligned, were like, shit, you know, <laughs> taking on these folks is, is not a good idea. And maybe I should sit around and listen to what they have to say and see how they can, in fact, improve uh, things here. So very kinetic, very kinetic at first. Uh, for you know, the first two months, I, I think I have got a journal and I, I want to say that something like 30 some days in a row, I was personally involved in some kind of kinetic engagement. And it might have been relatively minor with, you know, a couple pot shots, sniper shots, you know, taken randomly at us uh, to one's little engagements that might have lasted for two or three hours at a time. But all of a sudden, ironically, it happened to be July 3rd, uh, you know, the day before the 4th of July, went out on a patrol in the morning, went out on a patrol in the afternoon, and I was like, no one's shooting at us. What the heck happened? Um, of course, you know, we had other kinetic engagements after that, but all of a sudden it just always stuck in my mind that it was, you know, the eve of, uh, you know, U.S. Independence Day that that uh, didn't get in a gunfight. Man, can you take us to one of the earlier engagements? And for context, if you can share, okay, 
as a civil affairs unit, we weren't going out necessarily to make contact. What were you going out to do and what happened? So I'll, I'll talk about my, my, my first kinetic engagement in, in Afghanistan. And I thought, man, this sucks. My war is going to be over even before it began. So as I mentioned, I was part of that advanced element of Operation Kanjar that went in a little bit early. We went into a place called Patrol Base Jaker uh, to reinforce uh, a platoon of Brits, and there was a platoon of uh, British Gurkhas there also. We could only fly in at night uh, because it was just too much of a risk flying in a, you know, a big, relatively slow uh, CH-53 helicopter. And I think there were about 15 or 16 of us in the helicopter with all our gear strapped in. And it's like, okay, you know, you're going in and you know, you're, you're staying for about seven or eight months until your deployment's over. Um, we're sort of in that reverie that you are when, when you're a passenger in a helicopter. You can't really have a conversation because it's so loud. It's at nighttime. You know, you're just sort of waiting and you're sort of looking at your watch thinking, okay, I know how long this is going to last. All of a sudden, that reverie was broken because the the, the gunner, I think on the, the um, starboard side of, of the, the helicopter, just started railing the ground with a 50 cal and the helicopter just like banked up and then banked and was banking through the sky, dropping chafe flares. And I had a, an MVG on my, my helmet and I actually had a headset because the, the crew chief saw um, when I was getting on, I was like, okay, you know, here's a captain, I'll talk to him. And um, man, I flipped that, that MVG down. I was looking and there was like confusion, fear and panic in everybody's eyes. Uh, and we could see a couple of tracers coming up from the ground. And then, then by that time, the tail gunner was also shooting down at them. And I think we had two, maybe even three helicopters in the air. And they're, they're just going all over. And you're sitting there thinking, okay, there's a thin strap of canvas holding me down as a seatbelt. But that's it. And, you know, if we take a bullet through the skin of this helicopter, it's going to be bad. We're going to hit hard. And I was thinking, I don't know, man, sitting behind that desk in that law firm, maybe <laughs> isn't such a bad idea. But um, that whole engagement, you know, that was 10 or 15 seconds. And then all of a sudden the, the helicopter banks off and starts flying easy again. And over the, the, uh, the, the headset that I had on, the crew chief goes, you all right, sir? And I had been, I was scared. I was just like, man. But I was like, okay, you know, I don't want to let him know. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just another day in the sandbox. But, you know, tried, and who knows if my voice was quaking and everything. They landed and they, they came down quick and they came down hard. And, of course, they don't want to be a target for too long. So they wanted us to get the heck out of the helicopter. And they threw us out. They shoved us out. They threw all our gear out. And then they got out of there. When the dust settled and we were inside the, the, the Hesco berries at Patrol Base Jaker, my radio operator named Bobby Darheel, like, kind of looked around and he said something that to me was so profound uh, at the time. He said, damn, this war is for real. I was like, yeah. So that was my, my first kinetic engagement there. Uh, and then, you know, we, we had a couple instances where um, the patrol base got attacked you know, from the tree line nearby. And those were always defensive engagements. So it's, as you know, it's easier to defend than, than attack. Um, we, you know, I was a trigger puller as much as anybody else in some of those engagements, you know, sort of as an officer, it was more appropriate for me to be back in, in a few feet and, and make sure that people's uh, lines of fire are correct and that, you know, they're, they're engaging properly rather than for me to be too narrowly focused. So, uh, but, you know, we, I pulled the trigger quite a few times in those engagements. So, first, yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Sorry. Oh, yeah, so, so then the, um, the first outside the wire engagement, on the ground that I was in came during that period where we were pushing the security perimeter out. Uh, at this time, the the wheat and poppy had been harvested. So all the fields were were clear, but they had these, these packed up berms of dirt in a grid fashion there, and then everything else had been plowed. So we were cutting across the field. We had a mission to join up with a, an Afghan police uh, post that was uh, you know about two kilometers away from our patrol base and we've been out for about an hour and we were doing a bounding overwatch over this this field that was about 100 by 200 meters long and you know you take a knee the guys go across and there was a small berm uh, mud wall probably about uh, you know chest high and the marines were going behind there and then people would come across 
uh, spread out tactical spread, you know, one or two people. And it just happened to be that when it was my turn to cut across, you know, I looked and there were some kids with, with two cows and all of a sudden they had this look on their face and they started swatting their cow pretty aggressively and pushing it the other way. And I thought, huh, that's weird. And literally at that moment, as I kept plodding along, uh, I felt before I heard the bullets, but it, it was already hot because it's summertime in Helmand province, but I could feel streaks of heat zip across my head and in front of me. And, you know, it sounds like, and then you know, immediately after that zipping sound, it's like, crack, crack, crack. and I was like, shit. And just then I was like, okay, well, I've got to start running. And I, I saw a little spot that it would have given me some cover and concealment. So I started running to that just as I looked towards this compound wall where that was coming from and a dude popped over there and in my mind, it was slow motion, although I know it took, you know, the travel time for an RPG, maybe a half a second, but shot an RPG at me. And that went in the ground behind me. And I don't know if it was a meter behind me or five meters behind me, but it, it went in. And I think the fact that it was freshly plowed and, and the, the ground was relatively soft was to my advantage because I think it went into the ground and it was within that dirt, and it, but it exploded and it flipped me through the air. Um, and, you know, it put me down and, and I, I kind of landed hard on my elbows and, you know, just felt like both of my shoulders had popped out of, of their sockets. And I was like, damn. And then, you know, all these this zip, zip, zip and all these these bursts of heat. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, and I'm thinking like we've got a whole platoon going here and they had to pick the, the, the civil affairs guy. You know, this, this is when when I'm the guy in the middle of the field, they have to do this. Um, and. I don't, you know, it probably only seconds, but, uh, you know, I sort of contemplated life and I contemplated physics and statistics. And I thought, well, um, if I move, statistics aren't in my favor, so I better get moving. So I got out of there, um, you know, remember from from initial training, you know, the whole I'm up, he sees me, I'm down, I'm up, he sees me, I'm down. And I did that a couple of times um, and made some progress. But then there was a big pile of uh, a, a, of wheat chaff, you know, probably about uh, eight feet high and, and probably 15 feet wide. And that's, I wanted to get to that wall where those Marines were, but I was like, man, it's taking me forever to get there. So I was like, okay, well, let me get behind that pile of wheat chaff. And I got there and then my doc, uh, a guy named Gilbert Velas, he was there with me and, and we, we became close friends at that moment. Um, and I could tell that they were <laughs> shooting into this, into this wheat chaff because they were shooting into this wheat chaff and you could feel things hitting us in the back. But fortunately, you know, it was go through the wheat chaff and slow down enough that, you know, if you almost think of like a, like someone tapping on you with a pencil, I was like, well, shit, you know, they know we're here. So I had this idea that at the time seemed brilliant. And I said, Hey doc, here's what we're going to do. And I had a, 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 a smoke grenade and, you know, as you know, the smoke grenades, they've got a little bit of white phosphorus that makes some, some flames. Like I'm going to throw this smoke grenade on top of this wheat chaff and the phosphorus is going to catch it on fire. So then the, the smoke from the smoke grenade. And when this pile of wheat chaff catches on fire, it's going to, you know, make a, make a screen that we can, you know, use to, to get behind that wall. And I was exactly right. You know, it torched that thing and it went up pretty quick, like so quick. That I was like, Oh man, you know, we, we need to get away from this. The problem was, the wall where we needed to go was to our east. And there was a slight breeze coming off the Hellman River that blew all this smoke to the west. So that big, huge smoke screen that I made did appear, but it went the wrong way. And Doc and I looked at each other like, fuck it, let's go. And so we got there. So, um, yeah, that was my first uh, um, outside the wire kinetic engagement. But I'll, I'll tell you, um, yeah, I was with a... a Platoon of Marines from 1-5. Uh, the platoon commander's name was uh, Sean Connor, and he was prior enlisted. He, he'd been a sergeant, and that dude was cool as ice. Uh, you know, here, technically, I was I was a senior guy on the patrol because I was a captain, but, you know, I admittedly was a strap hanger. Um, and so, you know, I was essentially a guest of this platoon. Uh, those guys, they, they, they knew their movement. They knew their fire and movement. Um, and, you know, I was... Um, I was privileged to be be with them. And, uh, you know, when I got there and I was, you know, I was tired. I was sore. My, as I mentioned, my my shoulders were sore. I had actually taken a small 
fragment of a round, like a ricochet off a stick or a rock in my, my hand. Uh, you know, so that was sort of throbbing and, and painful. And, and I had a little piece of metal sticking out. Um, and But I was so glad to be behind that wire. And this one uh, young Marine in the platoon, you know, when I got there and I like get down to my knees, I'm trying to catch my breath. And he goes, sweet fire, sir. And uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm with you. I'm with you. So. <laughs> All right. I love this. Couple couple questions. And you alluded to it um from the from the helicopter story where maybe leaving that nice desk behind was a bad idea. How did you feel after that engagement where I mean you got some shrapnel in you, you got some rounds coming in directly at you? What was the feeling like for you at the end of that? Well, um I think Winston Churchill had a saying, it's like, you know, there's no more exhilarating feeling than being shot at and not getting hit. So, and I, I might I'm probably garbling, uh, mixing it up a little bit, but essentially that was the crux of it. So I was like, yeah, okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm here with, with these Marines. Um, from a tactical standpoint, it made me think about what I take with me and how I take it on patrol. So in my tumble, you know, some of my shit had come disconnected from, from my gear. And so there was a little bit of scrambling um, of, of, of picking that up. In fact, I had this cool high-tech pistol holster that was supposed to keep my pistol in there. And when I flipped around, you know, the way I hit, you know, that thing fell off. And my pistol, you know, when I the first time I got up to run, you know, fortunately my pistol was dummy corded to myself, but I was like, what the heck is this dragon on the ground? So I figured out a different way to secure my pistol. I figured out some things that's like, okay, you know, what do I need to carry with me and where do I need to carry it on, on a patrol? So, uh, yeah. but at the same time, I was like, hey, look, you know, this this is part of the job. And if, if this is what we have to go through to, to do our counterinsurgency mission, then we will. Uh, but thank God for the, the training and the talent of the, the Marines I was with, because I always felt like I was in, you know, company of, of the best America has to offer. Every time we stepped out on patrol, I, I never felt unsafe. I never felt uncertain because of the people I was with. You know, I felt unsafe and uncertain because, you know, we were going out in into the wilderness where people intended to do us harm. But um, yeah, as far as being with the Marines, you know, I, I was in good company. I feel like combat is such a, I mean, it drives the the trial and error process so quickly to your point of like, all right, next time, how am I going to strap this on so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't come loose and how you arrange your kit, how you move, what you think about, it just forces you to go through that so quickly. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to talk about and I should have asked you this earlier. When you were back at the law firm and you said to these guys, hey, actually, I'm going to go and get, I'm going to go to Afghanistan. What was that discussion like? It depends on who I had the discussion with. So I, I worked at a, a, a great firm in, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and there, one of the guys who was a managing partner of the firm was a retired two-star general. He is in the Army Ranger Hall of Fame. Uh, he served in Vietnam as, as an Army Ranger. Then he ended up going into the JAG Corps, uh, and his last job in the Army was as the senior lawyer in the Army JAG Corps. So he understood. And uh, again, when I talk about the presence of guys like uh, Walt Williams and Dave Briggs and Ron Holtman, uh, this guy, Mike Nardotti, had that presence. You know, he was, it's like, okay, yeah, that, that guy is an Army, a retired Army general. He was proud of me. Um, he and another guy named John Garrett, who was a retired colonel uh, who worked at the firm, uh, you know, to them, they're like, yeah, you know, we're proud of you. Take care of yourself. Take care of your Marines. Uh, and we look forward to having you back. Um, and one of the folks who um, is still a very close friend of mine, um, Bill, uh, Bill Nash, um, he worked overseas, but I did a lot of work for him. And I was really touched that he called me. And, uh, you know, again, said how proud he was of me and, and was looking forward to giving me a lot of work so I could catch up on my billable hours when I got back. There's someone else at the firm, you know, who was a little bit surprised and miffed about this. And um, I distinctly remember this conversation. He said, well, can't you just say no? I said, yeah, I, I could say no and not go. He said, well, then why don't you? What do you have to lose? And I thought for a second and I said, honor. And that, that was, yeah. that was the end of that conversation. Man, that's awesome. Okay. 
So, um, yeah, I was just envisioning some sideways looks like what you're going to go do what with with where you're at today. So, so but, but I will tell you, um, I, I, you know, I had that hard conversation with my wife, but we didn't talk to too many people about this. And um, it was sort of a surprise to my parents. And I told my parents about a month before I left for Afghanistan, I came home and said, hey, I, you know, I've been in the reserves for the last two years. And they were like, oh, OK, I wondered why you're maybe in a little bit better shape and your hair is a little bit shorter. Then I told them why I was doing this. And then we told some of our, you know, other friends and extended family. There were a lot of people who were surprised and confused. But interesting enough, everyone who I had served with in the Marine Corps, whether they were still in or whether they had gotten out, um, they got it. And, you know, they didn't bat an eye. And they're like, I get it. I totally get it. So, uh, yeah. yeah. You mentioned that you were keeping a journal. Just out of curiosity, was the journal something because you thought, you know what, this is a once in a lifetime thing. I just want to remember it. Was it, I want to write a book about this later. Where did the the idea of the journal come from? Because I kick myself for not doing that. So I, w- I will tell you, I'll tell all your listeners who may be still in the Marine Corps or the military and, and think or thinking about the military, keep a journal when you go, even if you go on a relatively event free Westpac deployment where you're a Marine on, on a, on a Navy ship and, you know, you uh, sleep until you're hungry and eat until you're tired um, because there will come a time where you reflect on those days and whether it's good times or bad times or funny times or sad times, you'll, your, your memory will, will not always be, be perfect. The other thing is I think you owe it to your family and your kids to tell tell them what what you did at some point to me it was just it was a unique experience particularly given my life circumstances that i was taking a break from uh, working at a, at a corporate law firm um but i had i had one son i had one or i had a kid on the way i didn't know at the time that it was going to be a son uh, but i was like yeah you know i want them to know what what i did when uh when when i was gone for, for a while at the time i didn't have any intention of writing a book uh but when when I did decide that I wanted to write a book, the journal play, played a big part in, in jogging my memory and reminding me of some events that were worth writing about. Man, very cool. Jealous. So I want to jump back to something that Dave also said to me, and then we could use this to transition into some of the civil, civil affairs work and some of the other operations you were on. What I was asking Dave was, and again, the, the sergeant major that you serve with, who is kind of helping you out on patrols, I said... Look, so you got this guy, Gus, who's who's there, older guy coming in, former infantry officer. How how did you perceive him initially? Like, did it take time for you to connect? Because he, w- when we started talking, he goes, Gus is one of the most amazing humans. <laughs> and he goes, Ryan, this is no shit. He's one of the most amazing humans. And so I was assuming there's a long ramp up for Somebody who's like, oh, here, we got a civil affairs unit. I'm over here instead of with one of these other door kicker units. And he said, no, not at all. Gus is just able to like drop your guard so quickly. He's so uh, humble, self-deprecating. He'll talk to anybody. And he had just such an affinity for connecting with people. And so that's Marines, but especially the locals, which is exactly what you were there to do, right? Civil affairs. Basically, you're like the mayor or the governor of this place for all intents and purposes. So he really said, like, we were set from the beginning. Like, we had a great tactical plan, but Gus just knew exactly what to do. And when somebody came to the base, they were coming to talk to Gus, maybe the battalion commander. So with that in mind, could you talk a little bit more about some of the the civil affairs work that you did, some of the crazy things that happened there? Um, So first of all, uh, Sergeant Major David Wilson uh, is the Marines of the 1st Marine Division are fortunate to have him as a Sergeant Major. When I suggested uh, that you reach out to him, I was kind of hoping that he would talk about NAWA and counterinsurgency in general. And um, he did. for, For someone like him to make a compliment about me like that, uh it it gets me a little bit emotional um and that's that's um that's the highest praise i can ever get in my life um i think the fact that i had been a former infantry marine gave me a lot of credibility with that infantry battalion 
I remember when I was an active duty grunt, there was this feeling about reservists and civil affairs. Ah, you know, who are these guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wear the same uniform as us, but, you know, they're not us. And I get it. I get it. Um, we quickly proved otherwise to to the Marines of One Five that that we were just like them. I was extremely fortunate um, at the time. First Sergeant Wilson was with one of the rifle companies, but my role to support the battalion really required me to get out and see the locals. We couldn't do counterinsurgency from behind the window of an armored Humvee. We couldn't do it in a way where we would just wait for the locals to come and talk to us. We had to go to them. Obviously, we had to be safe and secure about how we did this. I had a team, including myself and my corpsman, there were seven of us, seven of us to support a thousand Marine battalion in an area about the size of Manhattan's five boroughs. So we were spread out all over the place. I was kind of in the district center, um, but my Marines were out with the rifle companies and the rifle platoons. Uh, First Sergeant Wilson at the time came up with this great plan where he's like, okay, we're going to augment the civil affairs mission with some Marines who aren't part of, you know, Alpha Bravo or Charlie Company, 1st, 2nd or 3rd Platoon, but they're guys from the headquarters platoon. And so maybe they're intel folks, they're comm guys, they're grunts who are doing a rotation with the headquarters unit and they're doing radio watch. So we have this standby unit of close to 30 Marines um, that he pulled together to be what we would call the Kaggle squad, you know, sort of a play on gaggle. And there was a little bit of, yeah, okay, we were a bit of a gaggle, but he would put out an order like, hey, I need a squad of Marines. Who wants to go on a patrol? And there were folks who had stayed up all night on the late night shift on the radio, like, fuck yeah, I want to go out on a patrol. I want to go out with uh, <laughs> you on this patrol. Love and um, as I said, you know, we, we got in quite a few in kinetic engagements, um, and, and they kicked ass. They were awesome. Uh, I am so glad to have had that, that they had my back on those times. But a lot of times we went out and we would come across some farmers having tea in the afternoon. They'd be, yeah, sit down, drink some tea and uh, eat some grapes. And so these Marines were, were part of that. So um, and that all happened because of uh, First Sergeant Wilson and a guy at the time who was a first lieutenant, Mike Kuyper, um, who, who was was. You know, they were the key drivers behind that Kaggle squad. So I'm extremely grateful to them. He uh, he had this one story that I thought was interesting. And in a second, I'm going to ask you to tell us about the Polaroid camera, because that I, I found very interesting. But he mentioned, he said, early, I think it was early on as you guys were moving around, you had these two people who had who had like a land dispute. And obviously, you're not speaking the same language. And he, he said that, you know, like, Patrol stops. You're talking to these two. And he goes, it's like, this guy's a big time lawyer from D.C. He knows the law. <laughs> and these two locals have this serious land dispute. And he could see you working it through with the interpreter. And they both kind of left. And they're like, all right, great. We're good. We're out. And it's just like diffused. Probably something that lasted years that, that you kind of just took care of very quickly. And he, he's like, from that point on, if he said we needed to go and have nine cups of tea with somebody, we were going to go have nine cups of tea. So part of the reason that we were able to to do that and, and get those two competing farmers to uh, agree on something was the fact that we had some awesome interpreters. Um, so and and I still keep in touch with with um, the interpreters who, who helped us out. And, the you know, as you know, deploying overseas, we go to places where they speak Pashto, Dari, um, Farsi you know, Tagalog and stuff. And I get it. You know, we, we, we're, we're Americans and, and we're products of the American education system where uh, second languages and third and fourth languages aren't something that, that we do. So we couldn't have done what we did without the team of interpreters. I remember that particular day, uh, we had two of them with us, uh, a guy named Hamid and a guy uh, who goes by the name of John. Uh, Hamid was a judge in, um, wow. I, I, th I think, near Kandahar, but, you know, he, as a judge, he's a government official. And, you know, he got a note one day saying, Hey, you can keep doing your job for the government judge, but we're going to chop your fucking head off. And he's like, hmm, let me use my English skills somehow. He went out on every patrol. John, um, John comes from essentially Afghan royalty. Uh, and his family was forced to flee when the communists at the behest of the Russians took over in the late seventies. But he has a, um, his father, 
was a very senior Afghan minister. They came to the United States when he was a teenager, and he came back to serve his country, both his countries. Uh, but both of them helped me with this, and we sat down in the middle of the trail um, and, and talked this over, and, and you know, it was, you know, who owns this big field about the size of um, three football fields? And I just kind of guesstimated, but, you know, there was a tree in the middle of it, and then there was a, a sluice gate at the end. I was like, okay, well, how about if, you know, you take everything that side of that line and, um, you know, you take everything on that side of the line and, you know, it goes through the translation and, you know, just to double check that, you know, I said, okay, Hamid, you know, you, you expressed that. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, John, you make sure you emphasize it. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we got it. And so and they spoke Dari and Pashto and they, we did it in both languages. And we're like, okay, we shook on it. And, um, and we went on. So, um, Hopefully, <laughs> at least the time that we were there, they, they seemed to get along and, you know, do their their, it. their efforts together. Hopefully it, it went on that way a couple of years. Did you build a firm because you were doing some legal work then? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't have had a really good administrative support, you know, in terms of uh, putting together my, my billable hours. And Got it. Uh, co collections might have been a little bit of a challenge, too. <laughs> but we, we got paid in uh, watermelons at times, you know, for some of the work that we did there. And actually, we'll come back to watermelons here in a second. But first, can you tell us about the Polaroid camera? Because I thought this was ingenious. So I, I got this idea um, a few years earlier. My, my dad and I had gone to um, uh, Kenya and Tanzania. And we did like a two-week trek uh, where we were going through the Ngorogoro Highlands. We climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And for a large period of that time, my dad and I were with five guides, three of whom were Maasai, and our gear was carried by some donkeys. And we were the only Westerners that we encountered for that period of time. We slept in Maasai villages at night. And someone had said, hey, the Maasai are extremely photogenic, and you're going to want to take pictures of them. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, take my picture for five bucks. And you're going to quickly run out of money. Um, so what you need to do is get a Polaroid camera and say, no, I'm not going to pay you anything. But you know, let me take a picture of you and give you a picture of yourself. And then, um, you know, let me take a picture with, with my camera. So I was like, okay, well, it's going to be similar in Afghanistan. We're going to meet a lot of people and you know, everyone likes to pose for a picture and have a picture of themselves. So I carried, a, I, I, I bought a Polaroid camera on eBay and I bought, I don't know, I think like 1500, uh, uh, exposures, you know, they come in little packs of 10. And so, you know, we're, deploying you know it's like okay you got your flak you got your helmet you got your your weapons but i had this big cardboard box of of polaroid film that i took with me too and so every deploy i would throw three or four of those those 10 packs in my my satchel and it was a great icebreaker you know sometimes there were people who were like you know who the heck are you guys should we trust you i was like hey let me take your picture but and then when they see that picture slowly evolve on the polaroid you would see these these smiles of joy and delight and, and fascination and there were some times where you know i would see someone i'm like you know hey are these your sons and I'm like yeah yeah they are and so it's like okay here get together and that might be the only picture that, that that afghan ever had of himself with his sons so uh you know it was always a very popular thing and then you know it got to the point where people kind of knew my my nickname amongst the locals was jagran gus and so they knew that that i had this and so you know, and Akis, Akis is Pashto for pictures. So they Jagrangas, Akis, Akis. And I was like, come on, you know, I've seen you like every day for the past five days. I've, you've got like 10 <laughs> pictures of yourself. And, uh, but, but yeah, it, it was um, anybody doing counterinsurgency or anybody, quite frankly, just going on a vacation somewhere where you might be in contact with the friendly indigenous folks. Uh, everybody loves a picture of themselves. So get a Polaroid camera and uh, uh, give them that, that memory that they, they, that they can have. Yeah. And and just so you know, Sergeant Major Wilson also still calls you Jog Run Gus. Uh, and I was like, are you calling him Jog Run? Like, did he jog and then run? And he goes, no, no, no. That's uh, I think he said Pashtu for like Captain Major. Something yeah, like that's that. right. That's right. Um, OK, so so you kept Gus as the nickname and then they added another one on, which I thought was pretty cool. So w when we were preparing, I was asking you about one of the more difficult ops or something that could have gone sideways. And you said, we got to talk about a watermelon. And then you just brought it up here. Tell us what goes on with this, please. Never so, heard that segue, the watermelon yeah, segue. And and I'll I'll preface this by saying 
there, there's not a dramatic ending to this. But um, there were, as I said, Nawa was an area about the size of Manhattan's five boroughs, or excuse me, New York City's five boroughs. So Queens, Brooklyn, uh, Long Island, Bronx, and Manhattan. And when we came in with the battalion, I think we ended up with 27 outposts, platoon size outposts all over, platoon and squad size outposts. So we were, we covered the area pretty well, but there were still some areas where we hadn't gone. So word got back to me that there was, had been some battle damage in a, an engagement that the Brits were involved in before we got there. And the locals hadn't been made whole on that. And I had enough information that this, this was not just a, a glorified or exaggerated claim that the, there was some compensation owed. And we didn't distinguish between British battle damage and U.S. battle damage because, you know, that that, that would not have been the morally right thing to do. You know, we, we at the time uh, w was was NATO. And if if the Brits caused something, whether or not the, it was it was justified or not, and, and they had left, we were going to, we were going to make good on it because it was part of the relationship building that we had to do. But this place was way the heck out there. Uh, and it was it was a long patrol. People sometimes joke about like, you know, yeah, remember that time that Jagra and Gus took us to Pakistan? Uh, and, and, and we were out there for, for a long time. And it was hot. This is summertime in Helmand province. Um, but the locals were really happy to uh, to see us. And, and, you know, we sat down, we figured out what was going on. We figured out, like, yeah, you know, there's some money owed here. And and some, you know, I was able to fill out some paperwork on the spot. I always carried cash with me. Um, but um, they were very grateful. They were very grateful that we did, in fact, make good on the promises that had been made by the prior unit there uh, and that we we went all that way. And so one of the local farmers, you know, he sees what we're wearing. He knows it's all heavy and he knows that we've got to go back. And of course, we've got to go back a, a different way just for, for, for security reasons. You know, you can't go and then come back because, you know, the someone would be keen on that and lay an ambush or set some IDs. So we had to take a different way, but he said, Oh, you know, thank you so much. And everybody gets a watermelon. And so there are 15 Marines on this patrol. And these were not like the little, you know, kind of cantaloupe sized ones. These were big ass watermelons. And we didn't want to say, Oh no, we can't take this. Um, but it was like, okay, well, let's take this. So, I remember we were going down this dirt road and there was a little bit of a rise and we had a good tactical spread. Um, but I came up over the rise and I was probably two thirds of the way back. Uh, so most of the Marines are in front of me spread out and, and, you know, probably at least spread over a hundred meters. And I see every Marine in front of me and I turn around and every Marine behind me, you know, they've got one hand on, on the grip of their rifle uh, but under their arm, they, they've got this huge ass watermelon. And I remember thinking to myself, was like, this is when the shit's going to go down. Um, and everyone was really excited about getting back to patrol base Jaker and essentially having watermelon for dessert. And I was thinking, what are we going to do with these watermelons if an IED goes off or we walk into an ambush? Obviously, we're going to drop them but, um, and, and deal with the immediate threat. But then, like, when it all settles down are we going to pick up our watermelons or you know some of them are going to break and i kept thinking about that and and sort of you know walking along and thinking like god this watermelon is really heavy this watermelon is really heavy and and we got back to our patrol base and uh lieutenant colonel bill mccullough was a battalion commander and um he sees you know one marine come through put his watermelon down clear his rifle pick his watermelon up and he sees that and he sees that and then you know by the time you know i'm about the 12th or 13th Marine through, he's like, Gus, he's like, what's the deal with the watermelons? And I explained to him and he's like, you're a weird fucker, but I'm glad you're part of our team. <laughs> so, and, uh, and we everyone had a couple slices of watermelon that night. And it was great. You know, when, when you're out there in a place like Nawa and patrol base Jaker, you don't have creature comforts. And so little things like that, just, you know, I mean, it was just succulent uh, and, and everyone really appreciated uh, that so so um i feel like this is one of those moments that you can never picture when you say all right i'll sign up i'll be in the marine corps and that one day you're going to be patrolling and everybody in the patrol is going to have some giant ass heavy cumbersome watermelon under one arm and then carrying the rifle in the other right it's just hard to imagine until you've been there exactly. um, you did mention something when we were preparing for this about what you consider a moral failure which surprised me can you shed some light on that? Yeah. So um, in that that um, 
that engagement that I talked about, you know, the first time outside the wire where I wanted to get behind that, um, that big, thick, safe mud wall. Um, and, and I wrote about this. I wrote about both of these events in, in my book. Uh, the first part of that is called Envy, where I talked about how I envied the, the Marines behind that, that wire. Uh, the second part of that same event is, is a chapter called Killing Mere Woot. And um, we were behind that wire. And as I mentioned, you know, where I was, I was very happy for that. Uh, at one point, you know, we were popping up and we could see the insurgents still shooting at us. And so we were shooting back. Um, but at one point, a young man had come out of, of the compound and he was sprinting uh, from east to west. So where I was looking, you know, from my right to my left. And he was probably about 75 yards in front of us, unarmed. You could kind of tell, even though he was moving fast and, you know, it was a pretty chaotic moment. Like, okay, this is a young person. I popped down behind the the uh, the wall to keep my radio set and just advise the Marines because we had some Marines over sort of in the direction where, where he was going. Um, and I said, hey, you know, there's a civilian headed that way. Uh, as I popped down, you know, I heard one of my the Marines say, holy shit, you know, that guy just got shot. Uh, and I looked up and you could see him, you know, he had dropped down to his knees and, and you could tell he'd been shot. Uh, you could kind of see the look on his face. Uh, and then he sort of dropped down. He was in some kind of tall grass stuff. And I kept watching that spot, uh, looking at through my, my scope and um, I saw him pop up again. And, you know, he was kind of struggling. Uh, and then I could see he dropped down. I could see the grass moving as, as he was moving through there. Um, and I initially thought, I was like, boy, yeah, I need to go help him. So I went to this other side of the, this wall where there's a little bit of a canal and I started kind of crawling and duck walking and there was a thin tree, you know, not much bigger around than my leg. I thought, okay, let me get there. And let me, and I, I had kind of this plan to go get this guy and help him. Uh, and, you know, right in front of me, five feet in front of me, you know, the, the ground just burst, you know, one of the insurgents saw me, they started shooting at that. And I kind of fell back and then I went to go again and it happened again. So I came back behind the wall and was trying to figure out a plan. By that time, you know, the, the, the platoon had pulled back and we, we had a mission. You know, like I said, we had to get to a, a police post and, and reinforce them because the intel was that they were going to get attacked that night. Uh, and I could see the spot where this guy had gone down. And uh, I remember thinking at that time, there was a little bit of calm. We weren't getting shot at anymore. You know, the insurgents had, had gone out the backside probably. And and we had to move. And I remember thinking, ah, fuck it. He's not a Marine. Let's go. And we left. Um, and there, there's a lot of reasons why, why, why that's a failure. Uh, I was a captain. I was captain of Marines. Uh, even though the platoon commander was in charge of that, platoon you know i was a senior man present uh we were there to help people and here was someone who desperately needed our help uh and i had the authority to slow down our mission and help him uh but i was scared i uh, i was um uh, i was also relieved that we had gotten through that engagement relatively unscathed and i was like okay let, let, let's go so we left uh, we got to that uh, patrol base where, where the, the police were, and I, I don't know, 30 minutes or an hour after we got here, some locals came sprinting up to the patrol base, pushing a wheelbarrow, and in this wheelbarrow was this young man. And by this time, you know, he had a light blue shawar kameez, um, soaked with blood, skin, you know, he, he was an Afghan, so he should have, you know, had kind of this uh, dark skin, but he, he, you know, looked like ash you know, barely conscious. We, there was, there was a, happened to be an Air Force PJ uh, crew in the air and we called in a medevac and got him out there, uh, but they didn't have time. You know, they strapped him down. They did everything they could. And that, that kid died because of me. That That's my fault. That is not on anybody else. I could have, and I should have, um, you know, gone, gone through the, the gauntlet to get him. Uh, or when things had kind of settled, I should have said, hold on, Lieutenant, hold on. We've got to, we've got to help this guy. So, um, anyway, I failed it. I said, uh, you know, you know he, he died. Um, it's my fault. 
uh, but just as importantly, I set a horrible example for the Marines who would look to an officer to make the right tactical and moral decision. And when, when I had that opportunity, I did the wrong thing. So that's one of those things that uh, I think about a lot. Um, and I don't have many regrets in life or about my tour in Afghanistan, but that's one that uh, if I, I wish I could do a redo. I think you're being very, very hard on yourself. Um, and I'm curious if if it changed how you approached future uh, engagements at all. Uh, you talk about kinetic engagements or? Um, or so I'm, I'm just curious if it changed how you, did, did you change at all the way that you then went on patrols, whether it was kinetic or not? Um, did you think about different things um, like from a contingency standpoint, anything that went into briefings as a result from your mind? Yeah, a lot of times. And, and you know, I, every patrol, you know, I, I made a point of checking my first aid kit uh, because it, you know, my rank and position, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to be the point man on the patrol and I probably wouldn't have been the first man in the trench if we had to clear trench trenches. But, uh, you know, I, I owed it to the Marines. I owed it to the Afghans uh, to, to take care of them from a medical perspective if we needed to. And um, I did on quite a few occasions, you know, we had some similar events, not quite as intense as, the, as that first one. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I thought about that all the time. And, and uh, that was one of the things we, part of the job as a civil affairs Marine is to pay for things we've broken and to make compensation for people we've hurt or killed. And we went back and we made compensation to that young man's family. I'd learned that his name was Mir Woot. Um, and that was, that was, uh, that was a tough conversation to have, um, you know, to be there with the father of a, a person who ultimately, you know, his son is dead because of, of me. Um, I, I took a little bit of solace when he said like, yeah, well, this wouldn't have happened if, if the Taliban hadn't been here. And, and so, um, but like I said, you know, that, that's a little bit of solace. Um, but, you know, I, I think about that all the time and, and uh, I wish, I wish I could do it differently. Oh, geez. That is tough. That's a tough one. Um, you know, just what, one of the interviews I did with, with Elliot Ackerman, actually, who we were talking about the second time I interviewed him, he had talked about going through a kill zone with some Marines and one of the vehicles just didn't make it out. And having to talk about, do we go back in there for that? Like, what's the risk to the, to the Marines who, who made it out? And he's like, those are the times that leadership comes in. That's the times where like, you can't be prepared for something. Like you can't anticipate this is going to happen necessarily when you're a cadet or you're an ROTC or you're OCS or whatever it is. Um, and people are looking at you to make decisions and it's so hard because who, who, you know, like, would you have died in that? Would some, would another Marine have died as a result if you had made a different decision? Um, it's yeah. just so hard. It's, you know, when I think about that, it, it was, it was my responsibility. It was not my responsibility to look to a Marine to my left or my right and say, go get that guy. Um, I felt it was mine and, and I didn't live up to that. I've listened to Elliot's interview and um, he's actually a friend of mine and literally lives across the street from me in Washington, D.C. Um, so I, <laughs> I see him around every once in a while. I have absolute respect for him as, as a Marine and other things that he's done. Um, and, and I love his writing. Every time I see his byline in uh, the Atlantic or the New York Times, uh, I look forward to reading it. And he's he's just writing at a prolific rate. And so every book he has uh, is on my shelf right now. Uh, he's great. I, I, again, like, I don't know if you had heard me say this, but he was the first one I ever interviewed. And I still, to this day, don't even know why he said yes to that, but I was so grateful he did. And our meeting was like, we were doing an asset meeting from the agency, like had, had little snacks to eat. We're in a little hotel room and, and just like, all right, hopefully this doesn't seem creepy to you, but it went off just fine. Um, if you can, Gus, did, I know you had promised your wife this was a one-time thing. Did it ever creep into your mind to do more? Definitely. Uh, when when we got back, uh, we got back just before Christmas of 2009, and uh, my wife knew I was coming back, uh, but I, I was a little bit coy about what day that would be. Um, and as I said, you know, we were a reserve unit, so we'd come back to Washington, D.C. By that time, she'd given birth to our second son, 
and she was taking some maternity leave in California with her family. Um, and so I was back. She knew I was back. We said, oh, yeah, you know, we've got to count our weapons. We've got to turn in our gear. But I got the first flight I could to get out there to see her and uh, see my my firstborn son, who by that time was about 18 months old, and meet my my second son, who was four months old. And uh, so that was a great reunion. Um, but soon after that, I think in uh, January 2010, uh, that devastating earthquake hit Haiti. And the Civil Affairs Mission and the Civil Affairs Marines are quite diverse. And there was a call for people to go down and, and help with that hurricane assistance. And I think because of some of the success that I was able to be part of in Afghanistan, people said, hey, you know, let's send Captain Biggio. And I thought about it. I, 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 um, I slept on it for a day or two before I finally said, you know, I've got to stay here with with my wife and family. And Civil Affairs Marines went and they they were a tremendous force multiplier there. Um, but I didn't go. The unit that I was with, 1-5, ended up rotating back through Afghanistan uh, about 15 months later. And a lot of the Marines who were on that NAWA deployment went with them again, uh, including some of the, the platoon commanders who now become XOs and weapons platoon commanders. Uh, the weapons company commander was the OPSO. And um, he called me up. And he's like, hey, um, you want to be our civil affairs guy for Sangin? And again, um, I didn't say no right away. But, um, you know, I had made a promise to my wife. That was the most important thing. And, you know, I was doing, you know, I was on the right track professionally um, that I couldn't disrupt that that one more time. Wow. You, you can you can feel it when you answer that, the, and, and I know the feeling, so I get it. It's just it's hard, yeah. The the pull between the family and and the other family that that is the Marine Corps and combat and what that does yeah. for the brotherhood. Um, I I'm curious when you can take this either direction you want. Um, if there's somebody who's listening who's like, you know what, I. I kind of want to go do that, but maybe I feel like I'm a little bit older. Um, I want to go serve. Or maybe if your son came to you and he was like, hey, I want to go into the service. And I don't know if if either of your sons are on that path. What would you advise those people? Or, and would it be different? So I've I've been fortunate that a lot of people have looked to me as, as a contact and a voice of reason about service. Uh, and it might be either one of those scenarios you talked about, whether it's a parent who has a kid who's thinking about serving or young man or woman who, who's thinking about serving. Uh, and I always tell people that they should do it. And obviously I'm partial to the Marine Corps, but I'm more importantly, I'm an advocate of, of service. And uh, a lot of people have reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, based on what you said, I decided to do it. And uh, I'd love it if you could come uh, to pin my corporal chevrons on or my sergeant wow. chevrons on or my, my second lieutenant bar. So I've had a few instances like that. And, you know, I, I, I will be proud of my kids if they choose to serve in the military. Um, I, I will support that. Um, and and I, I will have the feelings that any parent will have if their son goes into the military. There'll be a combination of pride, but a little bit of um, trepidation and fear knowing that, you know, the military stays pretty active these days, whether it's, you know, big, big engagements or some of these small scale engagements. So, um, and, but I think it can't, the experience and the opportunities can't be replicated anywhere else. Uh, and it's the leadership experience, the, the, the sense of self and sense of worth, uh, and, and essentially really the, the opportunity to go places that, that you would never otherwise go and, and be, be involved in or even aware of uh, in, in any of the context. So uh, to any of your listeners who have, have thoughts about service or have children who are thinking about it, I'll be happy to um, have a call with any of them. And ultimately it's a, it's an extremely personal decision. So if someone says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it, then, then that's up to them. But I want to talk about the notion of service and, and what it means to you later in life. Uh, there's a writer named Sebastian Younger, and he's he's 
a lot of people are probably familiar with him, but he's got one of his books is called Tribe. And there's a part in that book where he's hitchhiking and he's sort of down on his luck. He's dirty. He's hungry. Uh, he's alone and he's he's hitchhiking. And there's a guy who he had seen who was clearly homeless and probably worse off than him. And that dude marched out to the end of the exit where he was sticking his thumb out trying to get a ride. And he gave him like a ham sandwich and a, and a soda. And he said, why are you giving this to me? And the guy says, you need help. If I saw you and I did nothing, I would be dead inside. So he helped him. Um, and me having my experience in service, it's maybe not as extreme as being homeless and, and hitchhiking. But if I hadn't done it, if I hadn't done it the first time, and even if I hadn't done it the second time, there would be something dead inside me. Uh, now I've done it, and it's part of what I am and who I am. And I think about my service fondly all the time. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, I've sort of, you can get all sorts of waivers, I think, to join any branch of the military. But I think age waiver and physical fitness waiver and all that stuff, I think I'm well over the threshold for that. But uh, I don't have that regret or anything dead inside because of the, the choice that I made to serve when I did and how I did. You mentioned that your son, your second son was born while you were there, right? Do you remember where you were when when you got the word? I remember exactly where I was. Um, so I was at Patrol Base Jaker, um, and <clears throat> we had a, a satellite phone that that was that, that we could use for emergencies or special circumstances. And um, it was we had a due date that was had come and gone, and I was would check in with my wife. I would say, "Hey, um, you know, I'll, I'll call you every twelve hours." So I set my timer to go off. I call in the morning and the satellite, you know, it was a strange connection with a delay. And, um, you know, we were always warned to not spend too much time on, on the satellite phone because it costs the government a ton of money. Um, so I'd call. And I was like, what's going on? She's like, nothing. I was like, okay, call you in 12 hours. And I think I did that for seven or eight days. And so finally, one night in early October, there was a full moon in the sky. It was quite clear. And it was actually, the nights were getting quite peaceful. You know, it wasn't the hot summer was over. And as the sun went down, it was, it was nice to be outside. And I went out uh, close to midnight um, and made the call. And um, I was like, what's going on? She's like, yep, baby boy. Uh, he's perfect. Big brother's happy. He's, he's beautiful. He's got these almond shaped eyes and you can kind of, tickle his feet and he gets just a little hint of a smile on there so everything's good and I was like okay you're good she's like I'm, I'm good you know and then she's like my mom's here my dad's here your parents are coming everything's fine and like I said there, there's a little bit of a delay and literally you know you, you you've experienced these moments you know the you, you you get a little bit emotional and I remember like kind of looking up at the sky and thinking I'm always going to remember that and at that exact moment uh our patrol base got attacked so I got attacked by three RPGs getting shot at us. And so they were the so-called shooting stars that went right over our heads. And then some folks were in the uh, uh, tree line to, to our west, and they started lighting us up. And there's a little bit of a delay. And so my wife's like, what's, what's that going on? I was like, oh, um, we're just test firing some weapons. So uh, I, I got to go. And I hung up. I was like, I love you. And I hung up. Um, and it was it was a pretty sporadic attack, it only lasted about five or six minutes, but you know, it woke everybody up. And I was like, okay, and that happened a lot. Everyone went back. But you know, I still had this, you know, adrenaline rush of just being known knowing that uh, I was a new new dad and it was a baby boy and everything was healthy. And so everything settled down and there was a couple of Marines still in the, the combat operations center because you gotta man the radios twenty four seven. Uh first sergeant Wilson was one of those guys and says, Hey, uh the baby came, it's a baby boy. And uh we mixed up some orange flavored Gatorade and we toasted my good fortune. And I, I was thinking, you know, who I wanted to be with at that time was uh, my wife and my family, but I was still in good company. And if I couldn't be with my wife and family, there was no one else I would have rather been with than uh, those Marines in the combat operations center at that time. That is awesome. <laughs> what a story. Um, 
can't wait till he's old enough to really understand it or maybe he is now i don't know it's 2009 maybe right i have a 10 year old i got a 12 year old i have a 15 year old so like the 15 year old could probably grasp it i don't know um but i did want to ask about the name of the book the wolves of helmet where did that come from so um it's intentionally a little bit misleading. There's a book called The Lions of Kandahar, which is a great book, but it's about special operations going in Afghanistan. And those are the badass special forces that everybody knows about and thinks about and dreams about. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I had a, had a different name for the book at, at first, but then I was recollecting one of the stories that I wrote about. One of my jobs was to essentially pay for things that, that we broke or, or you know, people that we injured or, or anything else. And so kind of got the word out that Monday was the day that people could come in and essentially process their claims. So this uh, this Afghan guy, and we knew him and we knew that he was ran with a shady group of people. He was good friends with the police chief who was corrupt as hell. Um, and he came in and he had son with him and he was carrying a tail from a cow. It was, you know, probably about uh, three feet long. He said, hey, uh, you know, there was a there was a firefight near my house and uh, my cow was in between the firefight. And so the cow got killed. So please pay me for this cow. And I'm thinking, huh, you know, this is and he described where it was. And I was aware of or I was actually in the middle of most of the firefights in that general area. And I was like, I don't ever remember a cow being involved in this. And if it wasn't something that I was involved in, you know, certainly I would have heard Marines talking like, holy shit, you know, that cow that walked in the middle of the way, you know, what the hell like that, you, that would have gotten out. And so I was like, well, do you have any pictures of the cow? Cause everyone had a, one of those cheap little Nokia phones with a camera, you know, pretty crude pictures, but they, they still were. He's like, Oh no, no, I, I didn't think to take any pictures. I was like, well, do you have, um, do you have anything else just besides the tail? He goes, oh, no. And again, this is all through our interpreter. He's like, no, I don't have anything because uh, the wolves ate it. And the interpreter goes back to him and says, did he say wolves? You know, like big dogs? And he's like, yeah, the wolves. Like the wolves? And the guy's like, yeah, the wolves of Helmand. They're everywhere and they're very fierce and they eat everything. And I, the translation comes like, oh, but they don't eat tails, do they? He's like, no. And he kind of knew that I had raised the bullshit flag and I was like, this isn't going to happen. And um, so, you know, he's like, okay. And he sort of shrugged, you know, like I gave it my best shot and then he left. So um, I always think of that, that moment, you know, the wolves of Helmand and, you know, there's probably some people have seen the title and said, Oh, you know, this is going to be about some badass special forces unit. And hopefully they um, will be more amused than annoyed that maybe they got duped by the title. Uh, but if anybody's got a problem with it, uh, you, you can track me down on uh on Facebook or one way or another and air your no. grievances. No, 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 no. Um, no, I think people know what they're getting into when, when they look at it. And it's, uh, I think it's described as having this spectrum of, Hey, you got some intensity here. It's a different look at what it's like. And there's the lighthearted moments too. So you, you, you know what you're getting into there. And, and, and that's, that's what I wanted to do with, with the book. You know, there are so many books and they're, they're fantastic books uh, that talk about, you know, the real tension and, and drama and horror of, of being in combat. And I wrote about that a bit. Um, and, and I had those moments. We talked about quite a few yeah. of them in this conversation. But also sometimes being in a combat zone and serving in a combat zone can have some uniquely funny and hilarious moments. Uh, but it can also be just boring. Um, but even when it's boring, it's like, you know, things might change at, at the drop of a hat and it might be, you know, anything but boring, but, you, you know, quite intense and, and dramatic and stuff like that. So I wanted to hit on some of those, those other moments of, of being in a war zone. Yeah. And that's why you keep a journal. So you don't forget those things and not like me. <laughs> um, so a couple questions to get you out here, Gus. Um, the first is. Was there anything you carried with you when you were downrange that had sentimental value, a good luck charm, or something that somebody had given you that you wanted to have on you? Yep, definitely. Um, and I'm, I'm going to answer that question with with a bit of a story. And the story revolves around a common theme that, that I've discussed, and it's 
not how I hit the jackpot uh, with the, my wife. Um, when we were getting ready to deploy, uh, those are emotional times. For all of your listeners who, who've gone through that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Here you are, you're, you're proud of what you're about to do, your family's proud of what you're about to do, but there's there's a lot of tension in the air because you know that, that hug that you give might be the last hug. And um, there's so much uncertainty about going to, to war. So all military operations, even if it's a routine troop movement, start at zero dark 30. So we had to be at Andrews Air Force Base at, I think, 3.30 in the morning. My wife drove me onto the base, our son at the time, uh, he's about 16 months old, I think. Um, you know, he's he's sound asleep in the back. And so we get there. I get my stuff out of the car. I take it, get it on the bus, and I come back. And, uh, you know, it's about time to say goodbye. And the best way to do that is, is to kind of take the Band-Aid approach, just rip it off and get it over with and go. Um, so I walk up to my wife, and she says, uh, I need you to do one thing for me. And I thought, wow, you know, this is going to be that, that profound moment where she's going to say something like come back with your shield or on it, which is, ah, is what the, the, the wives and mothers of, of uh, Spartans said when, when their, their young men went to war. So I sort of braced myself and I was like, you know, yes, what is it? She's hands me my son who had just woken up and she said, change his diaper. So, <laughs> so I changed his diaper uh, and, you know, put him back in his car sleep seat and, uh, you know, gave her a kiss and a hug and, and I left. But the thing that she gave me that I always carried with me in my pouch that was connected to my gear was uh, his, his baby shoe. And it was this navy blue with a tan stripe uh, leather baby shoe, you know, probably about um, four inches long at, at the most. My wife gave it to me. She's like, well, um the new baby, and we didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. She's like, the new baby, when you get back, hopefully it will be in December, will be big enough to, to wear these. I've got the other one with me, so um, bring this one back with you. So I always carried that with me. And interesting enough, we, we still have those shoes. And, of course, the one that went everywhere with me in Afghanistan um, is we can't get the dirt out of it. And it's, uh, you know, scuffed and faded. But uh, that, that's, that's what I carried with me. Where would you put it? So, you know, I had th this little pouch that that uh, hooked up to my, my gear. You know, it was probably, um, you know, about a gallon size pouch, a, a drop pouch, you know, that is designed to put your empty magazines in if you're in a fight, stuff like that. And and in that pouch, you know, I carried that shoe. I carried my Polaroid camera uh, and a couple things of um, Polaroid film. Uh, but then, I you know, I had enough space in there to put a couple other things every once in a while, but that that's where it was the whole time. Awesome. That's a great one. And then um, I think I know the answer, but clearly uh, for somebody who is out and then decides to come back in, win a war is in full swing, especially that point in the war when, when you deployed, as you look back at this and some of the really difficult moments that you had, which I'm grateful for you sharing, would you go back and do that again? Yeah, I would I would do it all again. And uh, other than the one moment where I wish I could um, change some some of my decisions and my actions, um, I would do everything again. So good, Gus. I'm so appreciative of your time. Um, we'll have links so people can find you and the book. And I believe the book also has a charitable aspect to it. That's right. Um, I didn't write this book to get rich, at least financially. I would say that when when Marines I served with or people who were in the Army and the Marine Corps who, who I didn't serve with, but they've read the book, a lot of them have contacted me and they've said, man, you described some things that I've tried to explain to people. Uh, thank you for writing this. For Marines with 1-5, a lot of them have said, thank you for telling our story. Um, I've had some parents reach out to me and said, you know, my son has been closed up about his experience in Afghanistan, but after reading your book, I think I get a sense of it. So in that sense, I feel like the book has made me rich. Um, I can't quit my day job, but I'm, I'm proud to have told the story of the Marines of 1-5. I think it's a story worth telling and also wanted to have something for my kids that, you know, when I'm an old man, they can look back and say, hey, you know, one time daddy did something pretty cool. Uh, but when I have generated a little bit of revenue from, from the book, I've tried to steer it towards different 
organizations that are doing worthwhile stuff. So for all of the listeners out there who might be interested in, in getting a copy of the book, you can get it through online um, sellers, but uh, you can also contact me. Like go, go to Wolves of Helmand on Facebook and there's a way to contact me. And from now to the end of the year, I'm going to donate the proceeds of any book sales to a group called the Mozart Group. Uh, and this is a group started by a former Marine retired colonel named Andy Milburn, who I hope will be a guest on this show someday. Uh, Andy has put together a group of former military service members who are now in Ukraine as we speak. They are providing uh, training and assistance to Ukrainian armed forces, but more importantly, they're helping uh, civilians in Ukraine who need to get out of there. They, To date, they've evacuated 1,100 Ukrainians who were stuck in, in hot zones and couldn't get out. Andy and his team uh, have gone into some of the hottest zones uh, in, in Ukraine. They did great risk to themselves, uh, and they, they've gotten people and their pets um, out of some hot spots in, into safety. So they're doing really worthwhile, noble work, uh, but they're essentially all volunteers. So anything that I can do to help them out in their efforts, uh, I'm, I'm going to do that. And I hope I can do that through uh, some revenue from the books too. That's great. Um, for those who are listening, who knows when, that's through the end of 2022, um, just in case you're watching this in another year. And the fact that they're helping out in Ukraine, I, I just love hearing that. We've got several guests who are over there now who had turned in you know, their uniforms from the U.S. and are supporting similarly uh, helping civilians or training folks, including one guest, Aiden Aslan, who's a, a POW on the Russian side now. So really crazy what's going on. Would be happy to support such a group. So I hope people, um, I, I'm certain people are going to be reaching out for this book. Uh, so I'm really glad to see that happen, especially when the proceeds go to something like that. So yeah. Gus, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. And thank you for being so prepared for this. You are you are up there with the people oh. who come prepared for these interviews. There are a handful. They're oftentimes Marines. So there must be something in the water there. I, I think so. Uh, Ryan, this has been a real pleasure. Uh, you've had some some awesome guests. I've listened to a lot of, a lot of episodes. And uh, I'm really humbled and honored to uh, join their ranks. Thanks for this. So much. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. Let's take some listener comments. And our first one is an Apple five-star review from TJ number 60. He says, I love this podcast. I've been mowing lawns and listening to it all day, every day. I finished all of them this summer. I've learned so much more about the struggles of our veterans and their experiences that have definitely humbled me. Ryan, these stories have inspired me to join, and I hope I can fly helicopters as well. And um, hopefully, as you heard on this particular interview, um, helicopters can be dangerous, but they're a lot of fun. And whatever path you take, I think folks like Gus and myself are very jealous of what you have ahead of you, which is what I say to a lot of folks who end up uh, deciding to join. But just uh, thank you for doing that. I remember back in the day mowing lawns, sweating to death. I do wish there were podcasts back then that I could have listened to. Uh, and I'm grateful that you take the time of all the things you could hear and listen to these stories of these incredible veterans and what they've done. So thank you for that. And thanks for leaving a five-star review, which helps us get this out to more people. Our next comment is on YouTube. And this one came from the Travis Norby interview. And it's from uh, Manny... Fobani. It says, longtime fan of this channel here. Definitely appreciate you talking to some conventional folks. A lot of similar channels are soft heavy, and I can understand how it can alienate vets who saw just as much action, but don't have the cool guy badges. It'd be cool if you could maybe do interviews with vets from different types of units, airborne infantry, striker, uh, Marine Muse, EOD, uh, from the Navy side, it would help diversify and represent more than just 5% of the combat vets. So we definitely did that here uh, with Frank. We've done that recently with a few other Marines in particular. And I am very interested in what these different vets do. So I'm on the hunt for that. I went through the uh, maneuver captain's career course when I was getting ready to be a company commander with a couple guys who had just come from platoon leader time with strikers. And I found that to be super interesting when I was there. Just, 
you know, it was a lot like an Apache on the ground, cruising around in Iraq, hearing how they operated, what they focused on, what they did was really interesting. So point is well taken. We're trying to diversify this a bit and we'll do a better job of that going forward. Thank you for your support and I hope you all stay safe. Thank you.